Building a Stuart 504 boiler plant. Part 8. Some more Christmas shopping, completing the steam turret and fitting the whistle and valve. And the first item on the Christmas list are these. Gas jet prickers. Gas jets get very easily blocked up. The hole in them is very, very small and it's always a problem with gas-fired boilers. So with the collection of these, I will always have unblocked gas jets. These are miniature leather drive belts, accurately cut to 5 eighths of an inch wide. The colour, texture and elasticity is perfect for the job. They're also available in different sizes, for use with larger or smaller steam engines. And I'll be featuring one of these belts in action very shortly when I make a video about driving the generator that I recently rebuilt using a model steam engine. And these brilliant leather drive belts are available from my friend Andrew at blackorchardleather.com. The next thing on my shopping list are a pair of these. A pair of piezoelectric gas lighters. No batteries required. These lighters have a flexible end, so you can light your gas boiler round a corner, keeping your hand out of the line of fire from the small explosion that happens when you first light a gas-fired boiler. The next thing on my Christmas list was some steam taps because I'd run out of them. So I had a ride over to see Chris at CME Engineering and bought various other things too, like a pair of whistles. These are the smallest whistles that he does and the 3 eighths of an inch in diameter. I'll show how I fit one of these whistles to the 504 boiler later on in the episode. A steam whistle needs a whistle valve, so I bought some of these as well. These are also made by Chris English at CME Engineering. Really these are designed for a turret inside the cab of a model steam locomotive, but by making a simple adapter you can mount the whistle directly to the valve. I could mount the whistle valve and whistle on the turret directly, but I don't think it looks very good sticking out of the side. Please keep watching, I'll show you where I fit it at the end. In this clip I'm fitting the steam inlet union to the back of the turret and you will notice that the turret is just about completely finished. So some of this video is not in the right order, but never mind, it's the way it is sometimes. In this clip, I'm fitting a brass blanking plug into the centre hole of the manifold on the turret. Why am I doing this, I hear you ask? Because I don't need three steam taps on the turret. They would be too close together anyway. I was quite pleased when I put three steam taps on this turret to find out that they all lined up perfectly, which was good, but they were far too close together. And you can clearly see this in this particular clip that's on screen at the moment. I used 5 eighths of an inch spacings between the taps, which is really too close, but I didn't want the steam turret to be a massive big thing. This turret, in my opinion, is about the right size and scale for the plant, and it only needs two taps anyway. So that's why I used the blanking plug in the centre. And the next part of the job, as usual, is to put all these parts into a little pot of cellulose thinners to remove the paint. And the pot in question is a top of an aerosol can. While the cellulose thinners, or lacquer thinners as you call it in the USA, is doing its stuff and removing the paint, it's time to show how I made the ornate column that supports the turret. I decided to show in this video how not to do it first, followed by how to do it. So I put the piece of brass in the chuck and the first thing I did was part off some of it. And why did I do that? Well, it was a bit long and it stuck out of the chuck a long way and I wanted to show any beginners that if you're turning a piece of metal, you need to leave as much of the metal intact before you finally part it off when you finish the component, not the other way around. So as you can see clearly here, as I parted off the metal to start with and shortened the bar, I'm going to have a very, very short column at the end of this. I'm using the micrometer on the square piece of brass to make sure that I turn the end of the bar to exactly the same diameter as the brass itself because I don't want the finished column to be of a larger diameter than the size of the brass block. As you can see this clip really is speeded up because there's a lot of it and it would be very very boring. And when I look at the statistics on the channel, the statistics say that most people watch about 4 minutes of the video and these days I've increased the length of the videos to around about 8 to 10 minutes normally. At the moment I'm turning the end of the piece of bar and this small protrusion, that's a good word, protrusion, fits into the recess that I made in the bottom of the turret. This clip shows the problems that I'm having because first of all I parted off a lot of the bar. I have to pull the bar out of the chuck 
and of course it's not going to be very well held in the chuck then so I have to drill the end with a centre drill and use a live centre and the column is still going to be too small but anyway I'll continue at the moment I have a parting tool fitted in the tool holder and I'm using this to profile the part now this is not as easy as it first looks what you have to do is turn both handles simultaneously and at the same time so I have a recommendation from my point of view I find this really easy for two reasons the first reason being that when I was a child I had a toy called an Etch-a-Sketch and I got really obsessed with this an Etch-a-Sketch has two dials on it and as you turn these dials you can move a pointer which actually scrapes aluminium dust off the screen and by accurately and carefully rotating these two dials together you can draw pictures on the screen Mine worked perfectly well until I dismantled it and all the aluminium dust fell out of it. After that, I didn't much use it because it didn't work anymore, but never mind. And the other reason that I'm quite good at turning two dials at the same time is because I'm a keyboard player. I had formal classical training, so my left hand will do things that my right hand won't do and vice versa. If you find that you're having problems rotating both of the lathe hand wheels to create shapes like this, I have a recommendation. Well, two recommendations. The first one being buy an etch -a sketch and the second one take piano lessons. Then you can join a band and have a life of sex, drugs and rock and roll, preferably without the drugs. So anyway, I made a thorough mess of the first attempt. Why did I make a mess of it? Well, first of all, I parted off the metal and it was too short. So I'm starting again with a new piece of metal and seeing how I go on. And apart from that column being too short, to me it just looked wrong and not fit for purpose. I didn't like the bit in the middle and it looked far too ornate. It would have looked okay if I was making a chess set but a chess set and a steam turret are two different things. So basically I'm starting again. This time I'm still going to do the same thing so I'm speeding up the video so it's not too boring but I'm not going to do the bit in the middle. See I'm going straight down the part this time. Watching this part of the video, you can definitely see the benefits of good manual coordination, although I'm not going to do it like this. Once again, lots of ridges would be far too fussy. I'm just going to turn three diameters at the bottom of the column. Now I'm working on the top of the column, and once again I'm just turning the small register, which will fit into the shallow hole that I made in the manifold. Now it's time to clean up the part using some emery cloth. I haven't had to use a live centre as before, but I did have to pull the part out of the chuck just to keep my hands clear of the chuck itself. I'm using some very coarse sandpaper followed by medium sandpaper followed by a bit of wet or dry paper. The thing about making items like this is that you decide how you want it. You're not following a drawing. It's totally out of your head. But don't forget when doing basic, very, very simple ornamental turning like this, don't make the part too fussy, unless of course the rest of the steam plant is equally fussy. I have seen some steam engines that are very very ornate, but this one isn't, it's quite plain. In the end it's all a matter of taste. Some viewers may disagree with me on this, but I prefer the column on the right hand side. The column on the left hand side is too short and too fussy. When I place the manifold on top of the taller, simpler column, it seems to look more in keeping with the rest of the steam plant. In earlier clips you've seen the completed turret. This is the silver soldering part of it that I thought I would show anyway. If you need more information about silver soldering in much greater detail than this, I have produced other videos on the subject. In reality this is not the neatest silver soldering job I've ever done. But in the outer part of my workshop where I do the silver soldering, it was very cold on that day, so I just wanted the job out of the way. Once I let the part cool to black and quenched it in some water, I cleaned it up on the polishing spindle. I didn't bother putting it in the acid bath, there wasn't really a lot of flux residue on the part anyway, so the part didn't really take much cleaning up. A quick health and safety warning, you must always wear eye protection when using machines like this and it's probably a good idea to wear gloves, but for various reasons and I've mentioned it many times, I don't like wearing gloves, I prefer to burn my fingers. Here is the turret part way through the cleanup process on the bench. I didn't really want a shiny, glamorous, polished finish on the turret. So in the last part of the cleanup, I use a piece of Scotch Bright, that's the green stuff, in order to make the finish on the turret match the finish on the rest of the brass parts on the plant. 
and as you can see by this clip, I think I've succeeded in doing that. I always find the steam tap on a 504 boiler to be a massive thing on top of the boiler that looks ugly. So I thought to myself, I know, I'll modify this to mount the whistle. It's certainly big enough, and it's big enough to allow me to drill a hole in the side of it to take the whistle valve. I've left the globe valve screwed into the nut because I didn't want to hold the threads in the chuck for such an operation. And after centre drilling it, machining a flat across it, drilling a 7 seconds of an inch diameter hole, which is tapping size for a quarter by 40, in this clip I'm threading the hole quarter by 40 threads per inch. While all this work's been going on, the steam valves have been in the small pot of cellulose thinners and now the paint is just falling off. I also put the whistle valve in there. So once I've cleaned everything up, including the whistle valve, this is how it looks. I'm quite pleased with this. By the time it's got the pipe on the other end, it will balance up and it looks much better than it did originally, I think. It's a matter of opinion once again. If you're making your own steam plant or steam engine, you can really let your imagination run amok. So all I need to do now is to make a very simple adapter to fit the whistle directly to the valve and it looks like this. And in the final part of this longer than usual video, I'm fitting the steam taps to the steam turret. Using some Loctite 542 as always, and here we have it, the finished steam turret. That's it for now, thanks for watching and I hope you found it useful.